Good afternoon and welcome to another EEAP safety presentation. I am Rick Roman and Michael Crowley. Today we are talking about personal protective equipment. Yes. And uh, we were going to be going over PPE from head to toe. Head to toe. We got glasses, harnesses, gloves, uh, leather pants that you wear, Rick. We've got it all that we're going to be talking about. We do. We've got a little bit of everything in here. Before we get started, just wanted to remind you we are giving away another smoker today. Yes, so yes, yes. at the end here, answer the trivia question, win yourself a smoker. God bless smoke me. Here we go. Bro. All right, here we go. So first off, Michael, uh, per personal protective equipment, is it a program or is it a policy? Well, Rick, that's a good question. Personal protective equipment program or policy. In California it is a policy. In other states it can be a program. Now it, they go state to state but remember when you're doing a personal protective equipment you shouldn't look at it as in one big wholehearted program but as individually. Rick if you don't mind putting that slide up just for a couple minutes. This slide you'll be able to see that I've got a couple programs. Now within personal protective equipment there is a hearing protection program. There is a respiratory protection or fall protection. These are some of the very classic programs uh, that are within the Cal OSHA business that you can see. So everything else would fall under safety lessons like foot safety, eye safety, hand protection. There really isn't anything, Rick, in the Cal OSHA code to be able to talk about a program for those kinds of things. So those would fall under the lessons and training and guidelines with that, my friend. And, and we basically have lessons to cover just about everything PPE oh my that gosh. you can think of. You think it, we can have it. If we don't have a lesson on it, we'll create that for you, obviously, no extra charge, and we'll put that into the system so that you can have that. But remember, most of these are going to fall under so policies, personal protective equipment policies instead of programs. So you mentioned that some of the other states do have it as a program. Yes. What if somebody in California wanted to do it as a program? Would, would that be an issue? Is that something that they could do? Would, well, I, obviously it's not necessary or required, but is there a reason that you would advise against it? Or it, it, it's, it when you start creating programs that are not necessarily required by the Cal OSHA law, the fear is that your safety manual gets large. And when it gets so large, it's difficult to implement. A lot of times safety professionals think the more paperwork, the better it is. And what I'm suggesting is let's keep it simple. Keep it simple. If you don't required to have a program, let's not have, have a program. But you may need a respiratory protection program. You may need a fall protection program. So instead of having a big articulate program covering everything in the world, just like that one of the first slides we had, Rick, with all those different elements on there, we have specific programs that talk about specific topics. Which it's is why we do the interview process when we create right. documentation right. and customer customize it for our right, clients. Right. All right, let's go on to the next here. So let's talk about some of the employer responsibilities. First off, you have to conduct jobs hazard assessments to determine if hazards are present. And Rick, when I say employer in this, let's make sure it's employer or management. The management needs to be able to do this. I apologize. Rick. Not a problem. So you need to make sure if hazards are present or likely to be present, which necessitate the use of PPE. You have to train your employees on the mm -hmm. subject of PPE. You have to approve the PPE for if its intended use, whether the employer or the employee provides the PPE, Michael. Now that approval has to come from the company itself. That's what they're talking about. The approval is not necessarily coming from some sort of the regulation or some other company. It's you saying, yes, that PPE or personal protective equipment is applicable and very reasonable for the circumstance that's ahead of them. And that's who approves it. Okay, great. So next you need to make sure that PPE is marked to facilitate identification of the manufacturer. You have to assure that the PPE is in compliance with Title VIII standards mm -hmm. and it's maintained in safe and sanitary condition. And you have to assure that the PPE fits properly so that you're not unduly encumbering your employees' movements to be able to perform their job duties. Well, let me say, I have seen a lot of people buy personal protective equipment from glasses, a lot of different things that they are just very inexpensive and they do this in a way where it just almost is a bigger problem than really how they fit or they're supposed to work. So you want to make sure you get the good stuff. We don't need to be spending $50 on a pair of glasses, but we got to get the good stuff so that it fits appropriately and it works for them. All right. All right. 
So next, uh, we're talk about selecting the proper PPE. So the first part, as we mentioned here, is in the job hazard analysis. Uh, it's a technique that focuses on job tasks in a way to identify hazards before they occur. It focuses on the relationship between the worker, the task, the tools, and the work envi environment. Ideally, after you identify uncontrolled hazards, you'll take steps to eliminate or reduce them to an acceptable level. Now, when you're doing these, this uh, job side task hazard analysis, I've seen a tons of different forms of these kinds of things, and I've seen them done in thousands of different ways. I've come to the conclusion that it really doesn't matter what form you use. You've just got to be able to hit and go through our little pyramid here in a nutshell. You've got to be able to eliminate the problem. You're first looking at things as, how do I get rid of this hazard? Can I eliminate it by doing X? You might find that you have to substitute something. Substit substituting it may be a chemical for something something else to get rid of the hazard. Then you need to be able to look for engineering solutions. Maybe it's a noise hazard that you have and really what you need to do is you need to engineer a sound box to go over that generator or something that's creating that noise. Administration and training, it could be something that if we just train them to do this a little differently and then coming back to personal protective equipment as the last one suggesting the hazard is always going to be there, we can't get away from that and wearing this is going to solve that problem. The reason why personal protective equipment is the last on that list, Rick, is because of the simple reason that it has the tendency to fail more often than the others above it. Sometimes they don't wear the glasses. Sometimes the vests don't work. Whatever they've got going on, you want to rely on that least and so those other ones. But as long as you're putting together a task hazard analysis that goes over that, you'll find that you get it. Now what you'll see here up on the right side, we got a turpentine SDS label. This is what the new labels should look like when you have them and you're putting them on your material and your chemicals. On there, it tells you what personal protective equipment you should be doing to use that. It says wear protective gloves, protective clothing, and protection from, from face protection so that it doesn't splash on them. That, those are the things that should help you with your task hazard analysis and getting to where you need to do. So don't forget to refer to the SDS lessons on that. So, but when it comes to the other other uh, personal protective equipment that they would use uh, depending on the job they're performing, yeah. that's basically the employer has to make those determinations, yes. unlike here where the SDS sheet is telling you what to do, that the employer has to make those determinations. The, the employer does have to make that choice, and I know sometimes the employer or the management, you think, well, we're not really sure. That's why you have us, and that's why we can come in and do this for you and help you go through what kind of hazards we've seen at other places and what things have happened. It's important for you to be able to have some ideas, and we would be glad to do that with you. All right, so when it comes to training your employees, so in addition to training them on the specific programs that you saw on our first slide, if those are applicable to your industry, um, your employees should all be trained on when PPE is necessary, uh, what type of PPE is necessary, how to properly don, doff, adjust, and wear the PPE, the limitations of the PPE, and of course the proper care, maintenance, the useful life, and disposal. Uh, so that they're aware of all those things. And you should absolutely make sure that your employees are able to demonstrate their understanding of it by being able to perform, uh, you know, putting putting that personal protective equipment yeah. on and showing yeah. you that they can do it properly before they actually perform the work. Correct. I would agree with you, Rick. Okay. So next. Michael, talk a little bit about enforcement because you, you always hear, I can't get these guys to keep their glasses on and, and what's necessary to make sure that these guys are doing this stuff. Uh, you know, personal protective equipment is something that must come with discipline. And I and I this is going to be tough for a lot of you guys out there. It, it is something that you just got to know you've got to get the stomach for. When you start addressing your personal protective equipment, you must also implement a discipline process. If the employee gets injured because they didn't wear it, it is still the employer's fault. I cannot use the argument in the defensive process, the Independent Employee Act defense, unless we have a discipline process. So I always say that foreman managers right down to the end should be able to have the ability to 
write up their employees. Because if somebody isn't wearing the proper PPE in the area where that manager is, the managers above them should write up the managers and that employee for not making sure that's done. I think that discipline's very reasonable. If we don't hire, if we don't hold accountable our supervisors to the level that we want them to hold their people to, then it never really works. Now, in this process, I do recommend some sort of discipline policy that ends with termination. For me, I don't have an opinion about one strike, two strikes, three strikes, or a hundred strikes. As long as they get to that spot, we're able to use that independent employee act defense. That's a key aspect when it comes to this. When you find a guy out in the field, you can also retrain them by using your tablet with the eeap.mobi system that we have out there, our mobile website that can be done off the smartphone or whatever, and they can be retrained right there. Once again, that's eeap .mobi. It's working extremely well. You should try to use that and uh, see if you can do that. My version 2 of the app is coming out very soon and uh, we've worked out all the bugs. We're just waiting for the programmers to get done with it. Couldn't come any faster. My gosh, Rick. It couldn't come, we couldn't come any faster. So definitely an important element is, is the disciplinary part because yeah. you've got to enforce it. These guys aren't going to wear their glasses all the time no. and it's just going to cause you problems. All right, let's get on here. Let's start taking a look here at, uh, let's start looking at the, let's start head to toe here and, and go through the different things here. Um, so first you got head protection. Head protection. So you got to make sure that it meets CSA and or ANSI requirements. Yep. Um, you should be inspecting that shell regularly. Ensure the suspension is attached correctly and discard them when they're damaged, Michael. What yep. do you see out there with, with, the, with the head protection? Well, the head protection that I always see that's the problem always comes down to the same principle. Uh, they're, they're either wearing their hard hats backwards, they, they, they don't turn around the headgear inside, or they have so many stickers on the hard hat that I can't see the cracks. A lot of people ask me, can you put stickers or stickers on your hard hat? The answer is yes, you can put stickers on your hard hat. But what you can't do is obstruct your hard hat to the point where you can't inspect it. That is also part of the problem too. So can you inspect your hard hat with a bazillion stickers all over it? Now I know when I get trained on a job site or I'll get, you know, get that job, they'll give me a little job site sticker on that hard hat, so I know that happens. Usually it's something relatively small, the size of a 50 cent piece or something. But when you've got a massive patch on the side of your hard hat, remember, one of those, ah, two, three, five, and now we're getting to the point where I am suggesting you could not inspect all the areas underneath that sticker to make sure that it was it just doesn't play. And naturally, there's besides hard hats, there's yeah. other types, you know, to protect against the sun or uh, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. welding helmets and what have you. But we're just going over yeah. a few of them here right. uh, that we're looking at in this example here. So the next thing here, we're talking about uh, eye, protection. eye protection. So obviously, it's designed to protect you from dust particles, metal shavings, chemicals blood, infectious uh, body fluids, light from welders. There's a lot of different things that eye protection can protect you from, which hence you got to make sure you're get, using the right thing for the right job. A lot of body fluids out there, Rick. Well, sometimes, uh, yeah, blood or, you know, medical and what have you, you've got problems. Well, hopefully you don't have too many body fluids. But if you got that many body fluids, you might want to go to a face shield. And if you wear a face shield, yeah, yeah, you should be wearing that over your glasses. So when it comes to the glasses, remember this. The glasses got to be able to have the company logo on there. Not your specific company, but the manufacturer's company name on there at the least so that they know what it is. These safety glasses have got to be somewhat comfortable. I've worn glasses that are just so terrible, I just want to kill myself. They're just so terrible. And they're massive. They go over my eyebrows. I mean, they're ridiculous. Do not do that. You want to find, as a managerial person, you want to find some safety glasses that you just don't put on and go, I hate my job. You want to put them on and go, hey, these aren't too bad, and wear them. Now, how often do you replace them? I recommend that you replace them when the other ones go bad. Okay? You don't replace them when they get purchased. I mean, I mean, get uh, they lose them. Sometimes employees will lose safety glasses all the time, and you just can't be passing out safety glasses until your head comes off. So what is a good idea to do is this. I'll give you the first pair for free, and when those are so scratched up and they get beat up, then I'll give you a new pair, but I want you to bring me back the old pair. And in that kind of a way, they you keep these safety glasses and they take care of them more. If they forget their safety glasses, then they can buy a pair of safety glasses to do the job. You obviously provide them for them, but you're not going to 
but just give them to them if they're losing them all the time. That is a suggestion. Or you may have so many resources, you just give it to them every dang day anyways, so nobody cares. So with that being said, it is what it is. All right. Let's move on to the next here. Now we've got uh, hearing protection. So hearing protection must be worn when noise levels exceed 85 decibels. When the exposure exceeds 105 decibels, dual protection is required. So you'd have to wear both the plugs and the muffs in a case like that. If your employees are exposed to 85 decibels or more for eight hour periods at a time, if, if it's that noisy the whole day, um, you have to have a hearing protection program. Correct. So how do they find out, Michael, if whether their noise levels are at 85 or 105 or what? You've got to get some at. sort of air and noise sampling system in there, and and you can do this in a couple different ways. You can have get a spot tester just off of Amazon, walk back there and just hold it to see if you're getting into that. But remember what it says: it's 85 decibels for an eight-hour period, and so the person, it's an employee, has to be around that for that long. So the true way to do it is to get an air a noise reader and put it to an employee and let them wear it all day long. These tests are very difficult to do, especially if there isn't somebody monitoring the employee all day because sometimes they'll lean into it or they lean away from the noise and so you don't really get that natural understanding or test but you should do one of these every year or so or you, every couple years to make sure that your noises are still in line if you're coming pretty close but I always recommend get a spot tester first and do that. I know what about the uh, I, they have apps even that you can get on your phone are, are yeah. those fairly reliable or you know, to see okay. if you're in the ballpark maybe and if you're close then you might need to have someone come out. I've tried something. I've tried some of these apps. I wonder how good they really are, you know what I mean? My I, I have an iPhone 5, 6 and you know I wonder how great it is. But you know these little uh, spot testers, I mean what are they 39 40 bucks and so whichever you want if you want to use your phone first to see if you get close, but I, I think just buy one. Why not just have one in your shop and keep it in the office at that price? Great. Okay, then let's move on here to respiratory protection. Uh-huh. So You've got a nuisance dust mask. You've got the picture there in the middle. That's just a regular. They're not approved by OSHA. They're not tested. They're basically just to use, um, really, if, if you feel irritated breathing in the dust, it's not really protecting you from any type of thing. Correct. Um, above that, you see the disposable respirators. And um, those, actually, you have to have a fit test to, to utilize those. Um, if you're using the, the respirators like you see down below, then you're required to have a respiratory program. Correct. And, um, and if you have a respirator program and your guys are using those, they have to have a doctor's evaluation and they also have to have a fit and uh, smell test performed, which is something that we provide Correct. for our clients. Now, with, with this regards, when it comes to the, the this respiratory protection, when you buy a box of respirators, they have a little manual in there that tells you how to use it and whatnot, and they'll always highlight in there that there is a respiratory protection program requ required, and they'll cite an OSHA law going with that. And a lot of times everybody says, well, the dust masks are a respirator, so you need to have that program. Just remember that in the Kalosha law, there is an exclusion. There's an exemption for dust masks, and that code that is cited on that box that you get with, I believe the code, you go quote me on this, is 1910, and that code 1910 is a Fed OSHA rule. So in California, in the beautiful great state of California, we have an exemption, so we don't need the full respiratory protection program if we're using dust masks. So just know that. Now, they don't need to be smell tested, but they do need to be fit tested. And what that means is you put them on their face, and they need to push it down and make sure they fit. It's a very simple procedure. We don't need to have massive training, and you don't need anybody coming out. They can actually do it themselves, but you want to make sure the employees know how to pick that and what they should feel like. Now, if you're out there on the job and they need to wear dust masks, I would be a bad candidate for this. Rick would be an excellent candidate for this. What well, great man. This dust mask needs to fit to the skin as best as possible. If they've got a beard like me, it, it, it just makes it a very difficult. I guess your beard is a dust mask to a certain degree, how disgusting that is. But really, you, you want to have a clean shave to get a really nice clean fit on that. 
And if that's something you want more information on, we yeah. actually have uh, some great lessons on the, with the difference between uh, using the dust masks yeah. and the, and those uh, disposable respirators and, and exactly what they work for, so you can get more detail on that stuff there. Right. Just go to your client center and look up that, and you will be able to see the greatness of our safety lessons on that. All right. All right. Let's get on to the body and limb protection, Michael. Body and limb protection, Rick, my favorite topic. I love my body, and I love, more importantly, all my limbs. Uh, let me tell you. So this guy's wearing these leather chaps. Uh, the front is covered, the back is not. You might be a welder or something. I always find those to be weird, but nonetheless, I find those to be very helpful if you're welding and stuff. A lot of guys don't wear those when they're pouring molten or they're doing anything weird, but just know that those are there, and that's a good thing. The harness we know about. Now, when you're looking at this suit, you know what I mean? This suit is very important. I know I have a couple clients where we wear these things. I got a, a rendering plant that, man, really puts off a pungent scent, and we like to wear that to keep our clothes from smelling like death froze over. But nonetheless, body and limb protection, these are some of the elements that could be pointed in that. I know there's a lot more, but you want to make sure that when you do your task hazard analysis that these are actually looked for, that you're looking for areas where these things, your bodies, your limbs, this could get burnt, this could get chemically burned, uh, harnesses and whatnot with that. And, and very important in training your guys how to how to put those suits on and off because you can definitely run into some problems mm -hmm. uh, not wearing that stuff per, uh, correctly. And of course, you've got the vest up top, which is mainly for visibility, not so much protection with you know in itself. All right, let's go to the next here. Hand protection. Boy, we see a lot of different kinds of gloves out there, Michael, don't they we? They do. They do. Got a lot of gloves, Rick. We've been to some of the trade shows and the amount of glove vendors that you will find there and the different types of gloves they have, you'd be astonished that they make a glove for just about everything. So uh, why don't you talk about a little bit with, you know, so, I mean obviously you're, you're protecting from abrasions and cuts uh, to heat to, you know, uh, just being sanitary, all different types of things. Well, the first logic with gloves is everybody should be wearing them. But remember, that isn't necessarily the truth. There are some jobs and tasks that are very difficult to wear gloves because they create an entanglement problem. So make sure you don't just say, well, everybody needs to wear gloves. Could be an entanglement problem. There's thousands of different things that you could deal with. Uh, we dealt with, uh, with some drywallers some time ago, and their problem was that they needed to reach into their tool belt to fill the itty-bitty drywall screws to be putting everything together. But at the same token, every time they, they touched those aluminum you know, studs, the, they would have a tendency to cut. So they got gloves and cut the fingers off their index finger and their thing. So when they reached in, they could feel those little screws with their fingers instead of going through the gloves. So there's a lot of different circumstances that may take place with gloves. Please take a look at them. Go through them. I prefer gloves for barbecuing so that when I'm barbecuing and cutting meat, I like to wear gloves. Some people don't, but other people do. So here's the logic of it. You're using any sort of burn gloves, chain mail, anything, and I, I really think you should really look at gloves uh, when it comes to using knives and a lot of things. They can help you in a lot of ways. Gloves, 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 gloves. And by the way, ask your vendors who give you these for some free samples, and usually they will do that. Great. So... Boots. We're down to the feet, Michael. We're Everybody down loves to the their feet. feet. Rick, how are your feet? Oh, uh, actually, they're pretty good. Just got some new shoes on them. I yeah, noticed that today, feet. Rick. They do look fantastic, <laughs> Rick. Shoes, shoes, shoes. Let me go over shoes. Employers are not responsible to provide their employees with shoes or work shoes. This is not part of the responsibility that employers should provide. Uh, Callish inspectors don't even expect it, but cal but employers can make standards saying we prefer you to have shoes like this or we want you to have shoes like this. So we've given you three different samples here: uh, steel toes, some basic work boots, and rubber boots that you pull over. Foot protection is something that really needs to be considered uh, out there. Uh, you really must figure out if you need some sort of steel toe or something in that regard. So I remember Slip resistant in some cases in some of these produce places. Right, right. And half of you are probably shaking your head, Mike, steel toe, I know you'll cut your toes off. Now, I, I know that one of you out there probably has a buddy who has no toes. I know nobody with no toes. And they build the, to the steel toes a lot differently than they did in the old days where it was just a cap. A lot of times there are a cone that goes down your shoe and there's a shank that comes down to the middle of your the front part of your foot. So there's a lot of things they do different. 
I have all my people wear steel toe when they go to your job sites and to your factories because they could kick something. They could drop something could drop on their toe. Yes, if a semi truck or a, or a Sherman tank runs over their toe, it may collapse and smash or cut off their feet. But the reality of it is the majority of the things that are smashing toes on a daily basis are really could be helped from a steel toe. Really, it could be done by a steel toe. So as I sit here and tell you, I think the steel toes are good. I think they're wonderful, but they are uh, kind of a pain in the butt unless you really get by a nice pair. Altogether, consider the boots. Consider something that's high ankle support, not just the toes, but the ankle support. Maybe there's a chemical. We want them to wear some sort of rubber boot like that or a non-slip in a restaurant or some other kind of circumstance. Shoes should be part of your hazard analysis that you look at and say, all right, PP across the board, starting from head to toe, what are you going to be doing, head to toe? All right. Let me guess, Rick. That was the toe. That was the toe. That was the toe. Let me just say that if you've been one of the very few that, that have been uh, asked to join us that are not clients of ours, you can call us over here at 800-734-3574. We'd be glad to give you a free on-site evaluation of where you got going on. If you are a current client and you have any questions, I can have my general manager, Sam Crawley the Great, go out there and visit you and answer any questions you have. We're here to make sure you're happy, and I know a lot of times nobody's perfect. Please let us know. It is trivia question time. This is how I give back to my clients to tell them that we love them, we're grateful, and we do it with a little bit of smoked meat, Rick. Yes, we do. So let's get on to the trivia question. Bippity, boppity, boom. So the question is, what is the Cal OSHA code for personal protective devices? In Cal OSHA, what's the Cal OSHA code for personal protective devices? Rick, the egg up there is unique, Rick. Well, that is a unique egg. Well, yes, he's he's got some headgear on to make sure he doesn't get cracked. And, oh, uh, yes. Hopefully here we'll be getting a, a winner here shortly. While we're waiting, this would be a good time to send in your questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and send those in. That way, as soon as we get our winner, we can uh, start answering your questions. So uh, we are waiting for a winner now. Now, as we wait here, let me just tell you, the personal protective equipment, you really should go through this. And so if your management system, oh, man, what are you doing on there? If the management system, Rick, are people actually putting, you got to call in people, 800, Rick, you don't even have the phone number on the screen. Oh, my gosh, I missed putting our All number. Right, the oh. phone number is 800-734-3574. Again, that is 800 734 Three five seven four. You have to Let's call switch in. There, there it is. Holy crap! Seven, Rick, you're three, killing four, people, three, five, Rick. Seven, you're killing four. people. You do have to call in. Oh, Rick. Sorry about that, folks. We got people answering on yeah, here. Yeah, we got a lot of people got, answering that. Boy, people must have not had to Google it because they got the answer quick. Fast, but, Rick. So the race is now to see how what fast sure, somebody Rick. can dial our eight hundred. Oh, there we go. Oh, we got right the phone there. All right, we got the phone ringing already. Hopefully soon. I mean, this is it can get a little ridiculous. <laughs> So All we, right, Rick. Uh -oh. That's a that's a fobby. That that's a problem, right, Rick? We should have known. We should have put the phone. We always do we that. Always right? We always put the phone number on there, and it's like, nobody's no, I perfect. just missed it today. Nobody's perfect, Rick. <laughs> but nonetheless, we do have callers on oh, the line. I have a call. They're going to answer it right now. But remember, if you haven't done, oh, it sounds like we've got somebody on here. All right, they're transferring someone to you. Pick it up, Michael. We're ready. This is Michael. Hello, this is Michael. Webinar? Yes, do you have an answer to our great question? I do, 3380. 3380. Three, three, eight, 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 let's, oh, you've got it. You've got it. Congratulations. We tried to make this seem like a radio show, but we were very excited for you. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, how long have you been a customer of ours? I'm sorry? Are you a customer of EEAP? Yeah, Cardinal Professional Products. Oh, we love you guys over there. We love you guys. Over there. All right, well, I'm going to put you on hold, and the ladies are going to take care of you, okay? Get all your information. Great. Thank you. Transfer. Seems valid. I transferred to Ashley. We're still on. Yes, Lori. There you go, uh, Ashley. The lady's on hold for you, waiting for you. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Hopefully, I didn't hang up on her. So if I hung up on you. Call back. Jeez, <laughs> All right. Question and answer time. All right, Rick. Steve. Do we have any uh, any questions out there? We do have a couple questions. All right. Let's hear. Let's go for the first one. How do we know when safety glasses go bad? Well, that's a good question. 
Uh, first of all, here's a couple signs. Number one, they look like Rick's bifocals here. You can't see through them anymore. Rick doesn't clean them very often. But sometimes you, they get so scratched, you can't see through them. So that's the first sign you know your safety glasses are bad. You can't see through your glasses anymore. Otherwise than that, they need to have the proper pieces on there. If there's a nose piece, that, that has to be there. The, if there's some sort of crack or they don't do well, uh, discoloring, uh, if you can't, if they don't, if they Hinder what you're trying to do, then they're probably bad. All right. We got any more, Steve? Uh, we have a question from Dave. Uh, he's asking noise level from what distance? Noise level from what distance? Ah, good question, Dave. Dave, the distance is the employee. So if the employee is two inches from the noise, then it would be... If the employee works two inches from the noise, then that would be the, the distance. If the distance, if the employee works 100 yards away, then that would be the distance. Remember, it's 85 decimals for an eight-hour period when it comes to the employee's exposure. That's what it comes down to. It doesn't come down to the actual machine itself. Good night. Help us. That could and, be problematic. And that Yes, and that, that comes to if you need a program. But even if, like we were saying, if it's 85, even if it's for shorter periods, he needs the hearing protection. Yeah. But it's going to be where the employee is standing and working. Like yes. you said, it's not the machine itself. It could be 50 feet away from him, and it may or may not be over 85 decibels. Yes, so. sir. All right. Any other questions, Steve? That's actually it. Only two. Steve. I appreciate that, Steve Greer, the man, the legend. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. All right, Rick, that seems to be our webinar today. Hopefully we don't get rebuked this month. All right. All right, folks, thank you so much for participating. Yes. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you guys next month. Any final statement, Michael? No, Rick. That's about it. We appreciate you coming, and we'll be back next month to give you some, uh, some free information. And once again, don't forget, it's free. Stay safe. Thank you.